So, I have to be honest with you guys. I only have a single page of notes for this one. And a lot of this, in fact, well over two-thirds of this, is gameplay notes, not story notes. I didn't have a lot to talk about in this game. I find that interesting, too, because... Um, when I walked into this game, it, I was told by three separate people that I know that this was one of their favorite Zeldas, if not their favorite Zelda. Like, way up there at the top of the list. And I'm with that. It's a really greatly designed game, and I'll talk more about my overall opinion in just a second. But I went into it, and I was like, oh man, you know, I'm, I'm really excited about playing this game finally, and I go through it, and I get to the end, I look at my notes, and I'm like, I've... I have nothing to share! <laughs> I feel bad because I, I have this this feeling that you guys have this expectation of me doing this big in depth analysis, but there's nothing to analyze. Okay, I have a few things to talk about, so I, I hope you'll you'll forgive me for this. I hope you won't be too disappointed uh, by today's episode. So, anyways, Link Between Worlds. Yeah. So overall, to, uh, absolutely enjoyed it. Absolutely loved it. Uh, as I've said many many times, I don't really prefer the 3D format over the 2D format, or vice versa. I like both 2D Zeldas and 3D Zeldas. I feel like there's a place for both, you know, in the world. Um, and so I had a lot of fun with this, especially uh, right after playing Twilight Princess. It was a nice contrast between the two. The gameplay is really phenomenal. The story... The story was typical, but very well executed, I think, and left me with a few thoughts, just a couple. And I, I really feel like the game just oozed polish. Which I'm going to talk about like as I go down here. So first of all, uh, whoops, hang on. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is the graphicing, graphical styles, and the gimmicky nature of it, and the map thing. Okay, so <laughs> as you guys may know, I've played Link to the Past uh, a lot. It's one of those games on this NES I used to just replay every now and again just for fun. Uh, and I'm sure we all you know, have games like that, games we just replay every now and again just because we feel like replaying a game, you know, and that was one of mine. Link to the Past, Mega Man X1, Final Fantasy VI were my three big ones. I would just replay them whenever. A Chrono Trigger actually is on that list too, sorry. So I would just replay them whenever, just because I felt like it. And so I, I was like automatically knowing where to go. And it was funny because the first thing I found myself doing without thinking about it at all, like pure habit... As I'm playing and taking notes, and, and I was actually working on something else at the time while I was playing because I'm trying to multitask because I'm really behind uh, thanks to the holidays. But I'm, I'm, I'm you know, going through this, and, and I found myself getting the 500 rupees necessary to go get the flippers without even thinking about it. And then I found myself roaming up to the flippers, and I was like, well, wait, I can't get here. Shoot, okay, well, I guess I'll go advance the plot a bit, you know, and... <laughs> Wasn't even thinking about it. There's a lot of times that happened. That, that's my favorite example. It's also probably the first example. But I did that a lot throughout this game, where I'd automatically go to a location uh, from Link to the Past in either world, you know, Light World or Dark World, a.k.a. High Rule or Low Rule. And I'd be like, oh, right, right, not, not playing Link to the Past, because it was such an automatic thing. But I want to talk about that. Now, did they do the similar graphic style and similar map design for nostalgia purposes? Absolutely, yes. Do I think that's a bad thing? No. Now, <laughs> I've talked about the nostalgia thing a few dozen times on my show, and I've defended how, how you know, it, one of the main reasons I designed that whole feature of Then and Now was to showcase how just because we have nostalgia does not mean things are not genuinely good. I, I have often been, been aggravated by the perspective that, you know, I only like Final Fantasy VI because I liked it back then. It's not actually a good game. I only liked, you know... Uh, Mega Man 3, because I liked it back then. You know, it, that's ridiculous. They were well-designed games, and I still enjoy them to this day. Is nostalgia part of it? Yes! But to go to the absolute extreme of that is ridiculous. One other thing I've heard, though, one of my viewers once said this, and I found this to be an interesting perspective. If I enjoy a game based purely off nostalgia, is there anything wrong with that? Really. Like, if I go back and I replayed Arquista's Ring which is a game that I do not actually enjoy that much, but I still enjoy playing it, I still have fun with it, does that qualify as valid? Because I'm enjoying playing it mostly because of nostalgia. Actually, that's a bad example. What's a better... Um, what's a better example of that? Uh, how about... 
Oh, I was just talking to the uh, to a friend of mine about this just the other day. I can't. It was a NES game. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Point being, you know, if there's a game that I enjoy playing just because of the nostalgia factor, is that invalid? I think no. I think there's nothing wrong with that. I think that needs to be acknowledged. You know that I'm I am enjoying game A because I used to enjoy game A, and not that it's a great game. But at the same time. I think that I can look at a game like this, look at the map design, look at the graphics, and say, yeah, those are good graphics, and yeah, that's good map design, and not because of nostalgia factor. Independent from nostalgia, I think we have good design here. They could have just copy-pasted, they could have just reused the same art assets, they could have gone with an actual sprite format, but no, they actually had to interpret every single sprite in Link to the Past into 3D, which is a decent amount of work by itself, and they bothered to put that, that legwork into it. They also bothered to uh, redesign the map in several ways. Now, the light world is pretty analogous, almost one-to-one, -to, -one, uh, to you know, the high rule is pretty analogous to the light world from Link to the Past, but low rule is very different. Uh, it's, got, it's got the same framework, the same skeleton structure, but otherwise they actually redesigned basically the whole map, and in a very good way. They obviously put their work into it. So I don't think the criticism that I have heard that nostalgia is the only reason anyone enjoys the graphics or design of the layout of this game is, is valid. I think that's ridiculous. I will also say, though, it does have another interesting feature which uh, made me think about it when I was going through this. This is basically the only Zelda game to ever do this ever to actually revisit the same world, the same map, if you will, from a previous game. The only other one that comes even close is Twilight Princess to Ocarina of Time, and, and that's really not a 1 to 1 at all. It's more like a 1 to 15, or some ridiculous variants like that. Um, and I find it interesting, I found myself thinking about it from a game design perspective. Like, when you do something like that, you have a couple of you have a couple of things. Now, first of all, there's going to be some problems with it. It's possible to go too far with replicating it. Um, I actually can't think of a good example of that right off the top of my head, but uh, so forgive me, I, I don't have a good example there. But if you're literally just copy pasting the previous map, oh, I got one. Um, Assassin's Creed uh, Brotherhood to Assassin's Creed Two. Uh, I, that's not actually a one-to-one, -one. that's not a valid comparison, but the fact that they basically took the same Rome and then copy-pasted it and then added more, so credit where to do, um, you know, it, eh. I get why they were going with that, I get why they did that, but it, it could be seen as a little bit of lazy game design. I, again, I'm not actually placing judgment on that myself. I, like I said, I don't have a good example of this. I've seen games, I just can't think of one right now. But having that isn't necessarily a bad thing, I think, especially if you do something with it. To use a better example of doing something with it, Saints Row 4 to Saints Row 3. Now, I know you're going to be like, oh, whatever, they just copy-pasted Steelport into Saints Row 4. No, they didn't. I mean, it is the same, again, it's the same skeleton, it's the same structure, but if you actually pay attention, they did a lot of work into the virtual Steelport in Saints Row 4 to make it look like the virtual Steelport in Saints Row 4, to showcase that it was a different place. And I'm not just talking about the big stuff. A lot of little details, a lot of texture differences, a lot of additions of the Matrixy stuff, you know. They did a lot of things, changed around the billboard, changed around the signs. There was a lot of work done to make it clear that this was not Steelport, it was digital Steelport. I feel like that's a good in-between and is also an example of what I'm talking about here. Because what we have is, is several things. First of all, the familiarity effect, which is very, uh, very prevalent in that kind of thing. For those who haven't heard me talk about it, uh, we as people tend to enjoy things we are more familiar with more than we would brand new things. It's just nature. It's how we tend to be uh, for the most part. So, for example, if you're playing... and this is my favorite example of this. If you're playing a civilization map, you know, a custom, you know, you start a new map, and you set it in a, in a world map that you know, you know, the real-life world, or Azeroth, or Tyria, or the Game of Thrones world, whose name I can't think of right now, you know, whatever. You, know, you set it into a, a geography you know, you tend to enjoy the map more, that map more, because you know where you are, and you know where you're going, and blah, 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 right? Familiarity effect. So that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is it allows you to basically have people who have played the previous game that, that has the similar map style uh, be able to know where they're going. They don't have to constantly be like, oh, where am I? There's no lost. There's no, you know, having to, to consult a map or anything like that because they know where they're going, at least roughly, which ironically brings me to the, the, the third point, and I think this is the best thing. You can play with expectations. Link Between Worlds actually does this several times. I only, uh, I only want to mention one example of that because it's my favorite example, the Thieves' Den is by far my favorite example of them playing with your expectations. At one point in the Thieves' Den, you have to save a woman who has been captured, and she asks you to lead you out of the dungeon in order to get you the, the prize you're seeking. And it's like, oh, 
Huh. Really? Now, of course, th that was an example of playing with expectations, and it's not the only example of that, like, like I said. But you can do that when you have that similar style of map thing. And I found myself thinking if it wouldn't be interesting if they did that a little bit more. Not too much. Again, we don't want copy-paste, and we don't want to overdo it. We don't want every Zelda to be set in the same world. But it would be interesting if they had explored this more, because, again, this is the first time they've ever done that. Um, you know, wouldn't it be interesting if we had a game, you know, we've got that new Wii U one coming out. We have no idea where it's set in the timeline yet. Wouldn't it be interesting if it was set after Ocarina in one of the timelines? So we actually have, you know, the, the basics of the Ocarina map there. So we know if we go over there, we'll get to the Zora River. We know if we go over there, we get to Kakariko and the Death Mountain. We know if we go over there, we get to the Gerudo Valley. You know, that kind of a thing. Wouldn't that be interesting? Um, I think that format for, fits a little bit better for the 2D stuff, though. So this was a good thing for that. Oh, speaking of which, really quick, one other thing I want to talk about with the graphics that was actually really neat. Uh, I noticed this myself. Uh, it wasn't pointed out to me. At certain points, you can see that the gra that everything is actually slanted. I'm sure most of you know what I'm talking about if you've played this game, but if you haven't, uh, like, you know, there's, there's, a per there's a statue sta that's standing up like this, but if you slide into a wall and you can see it from, the, from this perspective instead of the top-down perspective, it's actually like this. And that actually makes perfect sense because... The if you're the camera's top down, but the people aren't. They never have been. If you actually pay attention to the sprites, you're not seeing the top of Link, are you? You're seeing him kind of like an ice, almost not isometric, but like an angle, angled down. Like there's a term for that, and I can't think of it right now. And because you see his face, you see his body, you see you know his his full movement. Uh, so the camera's technically over here. So they had two options. They could actually just move the camera over, because we're working with 3D models now, not sprites. So they had the options where they could move the camera over here and actually see you know, everything at an angle like that, or leave it up top and angle the entire world so we could see it that way, which is what they did. It's actually a nice touch, and it does look much more natural, ironically, uh, given how unnatural it looks if you look at it from the side. I, I found myself amused by thinking that the whole world is actually slanted like that, and everyone's just constantly walking around like this. Um... So uh, that's all I have to say about that, I think. Uh, the Right, the I love the gimmick of the 2D mode. Uh, wall merging is what they call it. I absolutely loved that. It, it added tons of variety to the puzzle design and uh, additional options for dealing with things. It rewarded you for paying attention. I, I, I got myself into the habit of just like merging with random walls here and there. And I was actually rewarded for that. There's rupees, there's hearts, there's little extra ciders you can go to with extra chests, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, I actually found one of the uh, sword upgrade uh, ores as a result of just randomly merging in a spot and being like, oh, what's over here? It's a great gimmick. It comes in great in the last boss fight, too. Uh, fun little anecdote really quick. In the final boss fight, you know, you're, you're merged into the wall. He's merged into the wall. So my very first thought is, I t like, literally, first thing I did is I turned around and shot a light arrow this way, thinking, oh, ha-ha, and nothing happened. And I'm like, oh, well, that sucks. Okay, I'll just fight him normally. And then to my amusement, you know, when I fought him in that last phase, he's nothing's happening. I'm like, well, oh, okay. Then I shot, and then it, yeah. Anyways... But the 2D gimmick was really good. Uh, good. It added a lot to the gameplay, I think. And that's another thing I like about the Zelda series uh, in general. They tend to do that. They tend to add... Uh, they don't really change the formula, per se. They add something new to the mix. Majora's did this with the time thing. Uh, Twilight Princess did this with the wolf form versus the, the link form. Uh, and then a huge variety of items you can use. You know, Wind Waker did it with the open exploration and the sea thing. I could go down the list. You get the idea. Um... This game with the 2D thing is really the gimmick, that, that the, 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 the variance that makes it different from the other Zeldas. And good stuff on that. Um, I do have more thoughts on that, but we'll save that for when we get to the lore stuff, which is way down here on the list. Uh, the target audience. So yeah, this is actually related to that whole uh, familiarity effect thing. Who is the target audience for this game? Now, uh... What? Hmm? Hey. Unacquired... Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, so who is the target audience for this game? My handwriting's terrible. Um, I find myself curious of that thought because obviously the target audience is people who played Link to the Past, right? I mean, duh. <laughs> but at the same time, if you asked me right now, what's a good Zelda game to start with? As of this moment, one of the games that has been added to that list is this one. This game is extremely user-friendly. It is admittedly, uh, unless you're playing on hero mode, holy crap, it is admittedly quite a bit easier. Uh, I, I shouldn't say easier. It's, it's more forgiving 
than your standard Zelda. It's pretty easy on the death penalty, and you don't really lose much progress if you screw up. And uh, it's extremely smooth. The gameplay is phenomenal. Uh, the full 60 FPS is great. It looks polished, as I've mentioned before, and I'll be talking about more about in a bit. Uh, it's so if yeah, if you are like, well, what's well, okay, if you want to start with the 2D Zeldas, I'd recommend Link Between Worlds. And honestly, 3D Zeldas, I'd probably recommend starting with Ocarina. Um, it's it's like that whole you know you don't necessarily want to start a franchise with the first game slash show slash movie in the franchise because that's not always the best showing. You're not really going to be sure if you're going to like the franchise based on that one, especially since in most cases they were still getting their footing, they didn't know what they were doing, you know that kind of a thing. It'd be like trying to say, what do you want to watch? You know, what's the first Star Trek you ever want to watch? And I said, well, we should watch The Cage. I mean, there are some people that'll work for, but. You could probably see why I'd be hesitant to that. Or, or Star Trek The Motion Picture, you know, the very first movie. It's like, start start watching the movies with that one. Uh, might not get you at that point. So I think this is a good entry point to the game. And I think that was done deliberately, again, to, to try and catch more people into the franchise. As weird as that sounds, since this is Zelda. Um, I will say, though, there's definitely a, a strong amount of little details, and I wish I'd, I'd kept a full list, of things that were clearly there for people who'd played Link to the Past. I already mentioned the Zora's Flippers things and the Thieves' Den thing. Uh, one other thing I mentioned is there's a lot of little details, like the fact that there's the, uh, the, por the spots where the portals to the Dark World were still have, like, like the Mayamais, My Mayamais, there we go, uh, present in them. And 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 little, little details like you could you could pick up a little fish thing that was in the lake you know lots of lots of little stuff that you wouldn't catch if you hadn't played Link to the Past. Um, I mentioned the gameplay. I don't really have. I, I don't know how best to explain. It. It's extremely smooth. The 60 FPS I think works great. It was immediately you know, noticeable to, noticeable to me. Um, and playing it on the new 3DS, it was it was fantastic. Uh, it, it the smoothness of it though is hard to describe. You have a lot of agency in how you move. You're not on rails like at all. Uh, you, you, can, you, you can actually pull off crazy jumps you, you shouldn't be able to, and I have a couple of times. And you can do, you, know, you can fight uh, enemies in certain ways, you can, you can uh, maneuver through obstacles, you can, you can bypass stuff. You know, there's a lot of things you can do to just kind of work with the system because of how much freedom it allows you, which is why I call that, that, that smooth gameplay. And the animations are all brilliant. Uh, you, you, every single one of them feels great. Both you and the enemies and the bosses and the, and the NPCs, all of it feels like, you know, fully emotive, fully animated. Made it. Really good stuff there. Nothing but praise. Um, the game is also extremely explorative. I mentioned earlier how I don't have much to talk about story-wise. I feel like this is one of the biggest reasons why, and I'm not listing this as a negative, don't mistake me. But Link Between Worlds feels much more like an adventure than a story. Uh, like the the primary focus was on the let's here's a, here's a world or technically two worlds. You know, go. And you go about, and you are rewarded for exploring, you're rewarded for uh, perusing, you're rewarded for thinking it through. Um, one of the things I found myself doing without even meaning to is keeping like a mental checklist of things. Like I'd see a bombable spot and I'd be like, okay, I need to remember where that is because, you know, when I get bombs, I want to come back there. I'd see these big giant crack things that you have to get with the bomb flower and I'd be like, okay, there's one of those there, I need to remember that. Um... You know, I remember where the pond is, and I remember where the, the turtle is, and I remember where, where it looks like, okay, if I could get up to the second layer, I can, I can merge my way over, so I need to be tracking that. It rewards you for reaching out into the world and doing whatever. You don't have to, and that's the important part. You can just play the game. You can get by with renting all the items. You don't really need rupees. You don't really need heart pieces unless you're in hero mode. Holy crap, those Lionels. Whew, those Lionels killed me more than once. Um... We don't actually need any of that stuff. It is all optional. And there's a huge number of mini-games. Uh, this might actually be the most mini-games I've ever seen in a Zelda. I'm not sure of the actual amount. But there were tons and tons and tons of them going and, and collecting the rupees before 30 seconds. And no timers, you have to count in your head. Uh, the, the baseball thing, uh, the gathering the chests thing. I don't even remember them all. There were, there were tons of mini-games. It was great. I loved it. Um, so the game absolutely rewards you with that explorative sense of go out and do it. That adventure thing, and I really enjoyed that uh, aspect. Um, I also really love the overall design. I mentioned this already in the overworld, but this is also true in the dungeons. Special praise, by the way, to the ice ruins, my favorite dungeon of this game by far. Um, but I love the, the design. I cannot praise it enough. I wish I could sit down and actually go piece by piece and explain each you know each little detail, but that would take forever. Yeah, that, would, that would be an in-depth review level of thing, and I can't stream with 3DS right now. Um, but there's, to, to go over it in brief, the terrain is the main obstacle, 
which I actually like. Uh, in, in, in this game, there are certainly enemies, a fairly large amount of enemies, but they're fairly easy to circumvent, and with only a few exceptions, they don't really hurt that much, and there's usually not a large cluster of them unless that is the specific obstacle. So, so percentage-wise, of the types of, of, of conflict, of, of, of obstacles you have to overcome in order to accomplish a dungeon or get to a location, it's much less uh, enemies you know, much less combative and much more terrain-based. Lots more focus on getting across the lava in the right way or making your way, uh, you know, across the ice or, or navigating the sand dunes or ensuring that you get across the, the bottomless pits or being able to see in the dark. You know, tons and tons of, of emphasis on terrain in terms of design, which is, which is heavier in terms of design focus on the level design, but as I mentioned earlier, was brilliantly done. Probably my favorite uh, subversion of your of your classic style of this was actually the Dark uh, Temple, Dark Palace, the first dungeon in uh, the Dark World or the Low Rule, excuse me, Low Rule, where you fight the Gemisaur King. Um, great, great dungeon design there. I mean, all of them were great. Every single dungeon I absolutely loved. Uh, again, Ice Ruins being my favorite. Um, but I really enjoy the way they did that. Uh, also, there was, as I mentioned earlier, there, it, there, we basically have a medium penalty for diff, for failure, which is good. Uh, if you die, of course, you lose any rented items and you go back to your last uh, mark point, beginning of dungeon or wherever you saved last. Also, save points are everywhere. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And, um, but if you fail and you don't die, you don't lose tons and tons of progress. You know, uh, which uh, I think it was... Um, Spirit Tracks, I want to say? One of the Zeldas I was playing recently, I want to say it was Spirit Tracks, the penalty for screwing up was pretty bad. Like, oh, no, it was, um... It was uh, Majora's Mask, actually. The penalty for screwing up was bad. Like, you screw up and you lose tons of progress. In some cases, I had to actually really think about how to backtrack to where I was because so many of the puzzles had already been solved in a permanent way. And so I was like, okay, how do I get back up there? You know, And, and of course, you're running the timer the whole time in Majora's Mask. It was a very severe, uh, steep penalty for failure. Um, and this one, it's 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 not too light, but it's about medium. You usually lose like a, a room's worth of progress, or you'll go back a room, or you'll go back uh, a floor and be able to go back up and go. So it's equivalent of like three rooms of progress. You know, not too bad. And usually you get a little bit of damage. You know, the terrain damage is like one to three hearts damage, which isn't, which isn't too bad. So again, medium penalty for failure, uh, which encourages you to not screw up, but doesn't. You know, it, it's it's more of a slap on the wrist than a you know, punching you in the gut. Uh, which I actually do like overall. And again, contributes to that good entry into the series comment that I already mentioned about. Um, the next thing I want to talk about as I look down here. Uh, yeah, so yeah, the buying and the renting system. Very interesting system. Uh, this could be argued to be the other gimmick. I, I don't think this qualifies as a gimmick per se, but it does fundamentally change the overall puzzle design of the entire game. Um, most Zelda dungeons, hell, every Zelda dungeon, with some exceptions up to this point in time, has been what we refer to as backloading design. In other words, uh, at its best, which I think uh, Ocarina and Majora's and, and Twilight Princess uh, are, and Wind Waker are probably the best examples of those. Here's your overall dungeon, right? And it's designed in a way so that such that you can access, like, like, like think of it as, a, as as cracks in the dungeon. You can access, like, like, like. You, you, like it's a chunk of glass, bear with me, and you smash your fist down it, so the pieces that are cracked are what you can access initially. And I mentioned, I'd say it like this because there's not really a pattern, it's not like it's a Tetris plug, it's like you can go up here, and you can go up here, and you can go up here, you can't quite go up there, but you can go up here, and you can go up here, and this is all that you can do until you get the item for that dungeon. Then, a picture as if the cracks went away, now you can access the entire plate of glass. You, you have access to the entire dungeon at this point, that's backloading uh, dungeon design. Also, usually this item gives you some way to shortcut, you know, past some of the stuff you've already done. In this game, it's all front-loaded. All of the puzzles that require items are right off the gate. In fact, in some cases, they literally are required to enter the dungeon, which is also good design because it, it showcases, like, really clearly and obviously, this is what you need to go through this dungeon. That prevents, uh, it, it, it may be a little bit of a handhold, but it prevents, uh, it's, it's a quick and easy way to prevent frustration. It's an anti-frustration feature. So you don't go into a dungeon and then be like, oh, well, I need the flame rod. And then you have to leave the dungeon. Then you have to go over there and you have to do that and you come back. And that's not hard. It's just irritating. And I like anti-irritation in my games. This game has tons of anti-irritation features. I don't want to go down the list. It's huge. Um, 
But I like that front-loading design because it's it literally like first room, okay, now I need to use this item in order to get through here. Uh, one of the things that I found myself doing is just kind of roaming in terms of dungeon design. I didn't intend any order of the dungeons I did. I just kind of went naturally, and you know, again, that explorative uh, nature. And I found myself just kind of meandering this way and then doing this dungeon, then meandering this way and doing this dungeon. I ended up doing the Desert Palace without meaning to. <laughs> I kid you not, I ended up going towards the Desert Palace area and was like, oh, hey, well, I'll probably get the Titan's Mitts over here, so I'll go ahead and do that. And it was in Hyrule, so I figured it wasn't actually a dungeon. So I was like, yeah, okay, I'll go ahead and do that. Da, 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 da. And went my through, and then it ended up in low roll, and then I, yeah, about halfway through, I'm like, okay, this is actually the, the swamp slash desert dungeon. I, I kind of screwed this up, but whatever. The fact that you can do that, though, is great. Uh, the, there's there's very few limitations. Like like initially you need uh, you need to hit the th uh, three palaces in order to be able to do excuse me in order to do low, uh, high rule castle, and you need to be able to do dark world in order to do the other things or the dark dark palace in order to do the other things in low rule. And I think that's it. Other than like again the, you need the sand uh, rod to do this. The one you need the uh, fire rod to do this one. You need the or no this one. You need the Ice Rod to do this one, and I think that's about it, other than a few specific items, all of which, of course, can be rented at will. My point being, the fact this is this has to be. I mentioned earlier that you know it was one of the least linear uh, Zelda's I ever played. I believe it was Wind Waker, until I'd played Link to the, uh, until I played this game because I hadn't played this game. I think this might actually be the least linear Zelda I've ever played. The fact that I can just meander and do the dungeons in whatever order, and there's no structure to it. You know, unlike Link to the Past, where you pretty much have to do bam, 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 and then you can do the other three in whatever order, uh, or two. No, it's three, three in whatever order. And this one you have to do bam, and then you can do whatever the rest in, in any order, uh, which is great. <clears throat> but this gets again to that renting and buying system. Again, I love it because it's optional. I'll be ta If I ever talk about Bravely Default, uh, I don't know if I'm going to or not, uh, this will be another thing I'll bring up. The argument could be made that it isn't necessary to do this, that with more polished game design, you could, pr you could accomplish the same general concepts uh, in different ways, but the reason I prefer this method of doing it is because it leaves the option in your hands, the player's hands. You get to decide if you want to rent all these items and live with losing them each time. You get to decide if you want to go around and farm rupees and buy the items. You decide if you, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's up to you. You can do however you want to. And I like that. I like the agency being put on the player for the interactive medium of the video game. I love that. Um, so consider me a huge fan of the rent buy system. It's also interesting that, as I mentioned earlier, they reward you for exploring. So if you feel like buying, really all you have to do is go go roaming for a while, and you will get the rupees you need. The only time in the entire game I had to actually pause and get rupees was when I wanted the uh, the bottle that had that was like three thousand rupees to get, and I and that took me like twenty minutes. You know, it was just okay. I'm just gonna stop here and I'm gonna sit, I'm gonna farm bees. I'm gonna sell them to the guy. Oh, I'm done. You know, it was it was astonishing how quick that was. And again, that is optional. If you don't feel like roaming or exploring, you can go farm bees, or a couple of other things you can do, uh, like uh, the the Hinox or Hinox or whatever. You can uh, extort him and then save and reload and extort him and save and reload. There are options. I like that a lot. Um, uh, oh, hello. Uh, the Maya, the Maya Mais. I want to talk about them too. The Maya Mais might actually be my favorite collect the things thing in any Zelda. Uh, not that I, not that I have anything against Cold Skull Tulas per se. Um, but the Maya Mais, uh, first of all, are a lot cuter than Gold Skull Tulas. But more importantly. I like the way they do the rewards for it. I like the way they, again, encourage you to explore. The fact that you can literally hear them when you're near them is great. Uh, the fact that you can get almost all of them. Like, like you can get, I think it's like 70-something, I forget the number. 70-something of the 100 Maya Mais, pretty much as soon as you have access to low rule. As soon as you have the, the merge between worlds option. And bam, you can get basically all of them. Um... There are only a few you actually need a specific item to get, you know, the spin or the titan's mid or whatever. So that's great. Um, 
I love how they reward you for it too. Now, again, Gold Skull Tool has certainly rewarded you periodically, but I feel these rewards are better because of everything I just talked about with the optional thing. You don't have to do the Maya Mai thing at all. You could completely leave it alone. Or you could do it and get upgrades that aren't necessary, but are fun, but are cool. There's a lot of cool factor. The giant bombs, the triple uh, the triple arrow shot, the, the, the quad ice. I actually found the quad ice rod very, very, very useful. Um, so yeah, the, the upgrades aren't really useful, so and they're not super better. You know, it's not like it's a major upgrade, so you have to go get them. It doesn't make them mandatory, so it, it's straddling the line between useful and useless, which is very, which is a very difficult thing to hit game design wise. If, if you don't know what I mean, if you make it too useful, if you go over the line this direction, then players are going to feel like they have to do this optional stuff in order to go get it. If you go too far this way, they're going to feel like, well, what's the freaking point? And only completionists are going to do it for the sake of completion. Hitting this band here of useful but not useless, it's pretty hard. And I feel they hit that, especially because of, as I mentioned earlier, the cool factor. A lot of them just look cooler or feel cooler, and I liked that. Um, especially, you know, the fire rod. That was pretty cool. Um... I also like the the final upgrade, the 100th upgrade, which is the Mega Swing, which in addition to doing more, uh, or I shouldn't say in addition, I don't actually know if it does more damage. I'm not sure. But I do know it's a bigger area, which is way more useful to me personally. I almost never used the Spin Attack because of how little of an area it hit until I got the Great Swing Attack, and then I used it constantly. It's like, yeah, it's, it's a room sweeper, you know? I also, I know we're, we're not really talking about lore really quick, but I find it interesting that the Maya Mai's deliberately and deli directly referenced the fact that there's multiple dimensions in Zelda. Uh, I'm not talking about the multiple timelines theory. I, that can go out the window. What I mean by that is the fact that, as I've mentioned many times in this overall look at the Zelda franchise, there are multiple parallel or alternate worlds or realms within Zelda. You know, there's the Phantom Hourglass realm, whose name I forget right now, the Great Sea, I want to say. Or the, or the Phantom Ocean, something like that. Uh, so there's that place. There's uh, Terminus. Termina. Um, you know, there's technically Coalint. I know that doesn't quite count. There is low rule in this case. There is the Dark World slash uh, Sacred Realm. You, know, you get the point. So I found it interesting that the Maya Mai's just apparently travel between these realms over time. Uh, I'll, I'll talk more about that later. Um... The right. The last thing I want to talk about is the teleportation thing. The save points. First of all, there are save points basically everywhere, which is nice. Uh, it's weird that you can't save anywhere, but it makes sense in its own right because you can teleport. Like very, very early in the game, they give you the ability to teleport to any one of those weather vanes on both worlds too. That was a hugely awesome feature, in my opinion. For the exact same reason it was so awesome in Twilight Princess. Bam, I want to be here. Bam, I want to be there. You, you, you can just do it, as long as you're outside. And even uh, they even use it for a little bit of foreshadowing, because, you know, after a bit of time, it's just the broom, because she's been kidnapped. Um, but I love that. I absolutely adore that feature. And it, again, it is best because it is so optional. I know what you're going to say. That's not optional. Yeah, it is. If you want to just walk to your destination, you can. It's not like it's... Except in low rule, I should, I should say. It's not like it's hard. Um, for the most part, you can get wherever you need to go without ever having to use that. And I like that. But if you don't feel like walking, you could just teleport right over there. I ended up doing kind of a combination of both. There were several times when I would be wandering and not realize that I could have just teleported up and used the broom in order to get up there. And I was like, oh, well, whatever. I didn't mind the journey. But sometimes I just wanted to go to point A or point B, and I would just use the thing. Great, great thing. Huge convenience factor. Really enjoy that. Uh, I've said it before, and I've said it again. One of the biggest time sinks in most video games is travel time. Looking at you, World of Warcraft. And uh, being able to circumvent that is awesome. Uh, I think that's it. I think that's all I've got for gameplay. This has probably only been like 10 minutes or whatever. So why don't we talk about the, like, five points I have for lore. Like I said, I'm sorry, guys. I don't really have much story-wise to talk about. Um, so let's talk about Yuga first. Now, the very first thing I thought when I saw Yuga was, oh, my God, it's a Gerudo. He looks so much like a Gerudo. Uh, having thought about it after the fact, he feels like an amalgam of several Zelda villains. Uh, Girahim, for example, in his flamboyance and his nature. Uh, he even hums his own theme. Uh, Garu, you know, the Gerudo thing, again, is pretty blatant. Um, 
and he felt a little bit like Chancellor Cole as well. The whole, you know, sort of, you know being possessed by this thing and turning this hybrid creature thing. Um, overall, though, uh, I wish we had more of Yuga. I feel like there could have been more done to flesh out his character. Because there was like a little bit of tidbits there. For example, he has that ability to, to turn people into paintings or to go into a two-dimensional state himself. Okay, that's cool. Why? And I'm not, I'm not trying to poke holes in the story or anything. I just want to know why. I want to know what the backstory behind that is. For, you know, he has this flamboyant, you know, this obsession with what he considers to be beautiful, right? Now, I've seen that kind of trope in characters before. Uh, ironically, in Bravely Default. I've been playing it lately, if you're wondering. Um, so, you know, I, I, I see that and it's like, okay. Um, did he... It, was it because of his obsession and fixation with beauty that he developed this power, this unique power to him to do this painting 2D thing, the wall merging? Or did he have the, that unique power that was unique to him, and as a result of that, he began to view the world differently and then began to grow this this fixation, obsession on beauty thing? It's, uh, it's fascinating to me, the concepts there. And again, we don't know. It hasn't been fleshed out, and I wish we could have known more about that. Uh, I also... Uh, so, and, and the Gerudo thing, again, obviously, you know, he, he can't technically be a Gerudo, but he could be the low rule equivalent of a Gerudo. Uh, it would be interesting, in fact, to me, if he was literally Ganondorf's uh, parallel, if he was the low rule Ganondorf, if you follow me, the one male in a century or whatever, and this is what he ended up becoming and doing as a result of his power, because we know that the male of the Ganondorf, or the Ganondorf, the Gerudo has significant power, magical power, as a result of being that individual so it's entirely possible uh that that th that this is where he he took it it also makes me wonder if there's any male gerudo ever who isn't an evil bastard but anyways <laughs> profiling i know right next thing i want to talk about that i found interesting is the forgotten realms aspect of it for those of you who've never read any of the forgotten realm stuff or the fey rune stuff or ever played uh, any of those games you know, never won a knights that kind of stuff um, one of the unique facets of the setting is the deities of that setting require worship. Like, require it is literally their sustenance. If they are not properly worshipped, uh, the amount of followers they have uh, determines their relative strength level. And if they don't have enough, they will weaken to the point where they will actually, you know, basically go away. I just summarize excessively. Um, so they need that. They, they, you know, they, 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 need to they need the followers in order to be able to do stuff. I find it really interesting that they introduced the same mechanic here. We actually see that there are certain monsters, uh, most most notably Stallblind and uh, the the Gemisaur King I mentioned earlier, who are who have gained followers in low rule, and as a result are much stronger and much you know are, are reaching to to greater heights as a result a direct result of that a. a Meta, uh, physical representation of the metaphysical, in addition to the obvious fact that they are they have significantly more sway, political power, you know, military power, etc. And the Gemisaur King, of course, certainly has plenty of economic power since it just has to go, and then it'll get more money. <laughs> uh, but I find that aspect fascinating, and again, makes me wonder about if that's true in all of Zelda, and this is just the first time we've seen that, or if that's something that is significant to Low Rule in particular, because we don't really know the rules of Low Rule, not really. Um, uh, one of the things I wonder is how the Triforce got split up. Uh, th this weirds me out a bit. Uh, this could be a little bit of history being mishandled. This could be a retcon. I don't know. I, it's probably a retcon. But the fact that the Triforce went from being the unified Triforce at the end of Link to the Past to the split up version of, you know, all, all three pieces being where you'd expect them to be in this game kind of made me scratch my head. It is interesting, though, that they used this to bridge Link between uh, Link, Link to the Past to The Legend of Zelda, the original game, the first game, Legend of Zelda 1. Because in Legend of Zelda 1, if you'll remember, Ganon's already out and about. Like, he's resurrected and good. You know, he's, he's, he's fine. Uh, he has the Triforce of Power, so that's the second thing. Uh, Zelda, excuse me, the royal family had the Triforce of Wisdom, split it up in the game, and the Triforce of Courage was lost. All of these things happen over the course of Link Between Worlds. Ganon is brought back and then left, you know, in some kind of banished or destroyed state. We're not really sure because they don't cover it at all. Uh, the Triforce of Wisdom is with uh, Zelda. The Triforce of Courage, which was in Link, is lost. And the Triforce of Power, of course, is, is with Ganon. So we have the, the, the basics of the scene set for the original Legend of Zelda, which I think it's interesting they bothered to add that. Um... 
Uh, one other thing uh, I want to talk about there, too, is the the significance of the Triforce itself. I've mentioned before my, my thoughts on how the three goddesses are terrible people. Uh, mostly that came up in Wind Waker. But I find myself wondering yet again why they are so terrible people. Okay, so we're going to make this, this Triforce thing. And it's ridiculously powerful. It, in, anyone who wields even a single piece of it is, is augmented, is superhuman. But if you wield all three, you can do basically whatever. And natural, I mean, I mean, that's just the kind of thing that would logically engender the the war and bloodshed and 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 horrible, horrible things that have happened throughout the course of the entire series, off camera and on, as a result of of, of desiring this prize. Oh, and by the way, your reality is tied into its existence. We see pretty clearly how bad Low Rule gets as a direct result of lacking a Triforce. Uh, it, it actually reminds me of Kingdom Hearts in a way, although a much more insidious and slower version. In Kingdom Hearts, if a world loses its heart, it pretty much immediately goes and, and gets split into pieces and, and chunks of it go to the world of darkness, chunks of it go to the end of the world, you know, that kind of thing. And all its citizens go wherever they're going to go. It happens pretty much like that. Um, but here it's been happening over the course of God knows how long. I get I, We don't actually know how long. I always had the impression that's been going on at least two generations uh, for all of Hilda's life and probably all of her parents' life as well. Uh, possibly even longer than that. We, we don't really know. But the point is, even if it's only been going on for like a decade, and it has been going on for years, we know that, even if it's only been going on for like a decade, that is a long, slow, gradual decline. That is literally the world just slowly breaking away piece by piece, which, like I said, is much more insidious and much more horrible uh, when you actually think about it. And I love how they presented that. It's one of the things I loved about the, the map design of Low Rule. It's, you can really get the impression of this being a broken world, a, a world that is quite literally falling apart and, and denaturizing, if you will. Um, I, do, I, I, do, I do like the fact that they could rebuild that Triforce thanks to the other Triforce, because that's just the level of power they put in things. But seriously, what, what were the three goddesses thinking? Uh, whatever. Um, but speaking of that ruin thing, I'm reminded very much of Termina. Bear with me. I don't think low rule is Termina. Let me make that clear. But the parallels are definitely there in, in my mind. Uh, the mask thing, which I'll actually talk about next, is, is definitely a part of that. Or the masks, I should say, thing. But the other thing is Termina was a world faced with doom in three days. Now, as I talked about in Majora's Mask, I felt like Termina was doing the long slide into decay thing well before Majora showed up. But the, the, that, that's kind of the, the, where we're at with Low Rule. Low Rule is doing the we're doomed in three days thing, except it's doomed in like three years or 30 years or however much longer it's going to take. And I love the fact that they actually showcase how much of an impact that has on the people who live there. I don't think the people in Low Rule are jerks, as they are sometimes proclaimed to be. We actually see several of the people in Low Rule who, once they interact with the player or with each other or whatever, are pretty decent people. They're just pretty decent people whose world is being destroyed. <laughs> I mean, for God's sakes, wouldn't that, wouldn't that put you in kind of a permanently bad mood? Especially if it has been going on as long as I speculate. Imagine you were born into a world that's dying. And imagine that it's been dying since they were born, since your parents were born. Imagine that you have to, you have the knowledge that by the time you pass on, the world will still be wrecking. You know that that's that just taints everything. And I love that they showcase that that they showcase how the impact it has on the people and the culture. It's probably my favorite thing of the game, story wise. I know, I know, depressing, but still. Um, I mean, we see this in every character. Hilda is probably the strongest example, a otherwise decent, you know, strong-willed woman who is driven to destroying another world because that's how desperate and that's how horrible things have just become. And again, I, I would almost guarantee she has at least been born while this was going on, at, at the very least. You know, this is something that's been going on her entire life. It, it, it's horrible. How do you deal with something like that? How, how do you endure something like that? Well, that leads me into the masks thing. One of the things I like about the masks thing, uh, again, parallel to Majora's Mask, is it showcases how people are trying to deal with the problem in their own little way. It's actually like a bit of a subplot throughout the course of the game. 
all of these people, uh, for those of you not aware, they, they have these monster masks. And so some people have been subject, willingly subjugating themselves to monsters. Uh, some people have been just wearing the masks and trying to, to get along with their monster brethren or otherwise because they feel like, you know, well, they, they've lost all hope in the kingdom. They've lost all hope in themselves. So they wear a mask. And the mask them is okay. The mask them is going to adapt. The mask them is going to survive. And it became this whole cultural thing, mumbo jumbo, you know, that whole thing. Um, and in some cases, we see them interacting with some of the more benign, peaceful, you know, nice monsters in a positive manner, having actual coexistence with them. And in some cases, we see them completely subjugated, again, like, like the Gemisaur I mentioned earlier. Um, but I like that, and I like the fact that that was done deliberately by, I forget his name, the the, the low rule equivalent of Sasarala, Sasarala, Sasarala. Um, to help the people keep going. Another nice parallel there is the fact that the masks are, like you make a mask of the monster you think you are, because you're becoming the mask. That's the whole point of that, that, that cultural thing. You are now this new person. Here's your mask to signify the new you. And in a similar way to how the dark world would morph you based on yourself, the people wear these masks to showcase who they think they really are, or who they actually are. It depends. We're not actually sure about that. But it's a nice touch, and I really, really like that. And I wish I had more to say about it. I don't, unfortunately. Uh, I would love to really examine that kind of a culture. I would love to if there was more uh, just everyday people and, and the way they're dealing with you know, this, this horrible, horrible setting. As, as, as ever, Zelda games are pretty dark games. That's always been true. You know, going far back at least as far as Zelda 2. Uh, but... The, this is probably one of the most depressing worlds I've ever seen in a Zelda game. This low rule is in a in a uh, what do I call it? The Quiet Apocalypse is what I call that. You know, the, it's there's, you know, there's not zombie hordes everywhere, and there's not some big moon coming down, and there's not you know, no. It's just kind of quietly, slowly fading. <sighs> Which brings me, of course, to Ravio, aka Low Rule Link. Uh, spoiler alert, by the way. Um, I have to admit, I didn't, I didn't guess it. I didn't guess it when I was going through the game. Or rather, I kind of did. <laughs> See, I had a different theory as I was going through the game. I thought he was the low rule equivalent of Link, but not as a hero, not as like the, the courage person, not as the embodiment of Link, or looking like him or anything like that. I figured he was the uh, inverse, the parallel to Link. What is Link if not the quintessential PC? player character. He is someone who, I mean, he, he adheres to all the tropes in basically every game. He can walk into a house at random, take stuff, break stuff. He's the one saving the world. He's the one who everyone has, he has, to, he has to pay for everything he gets. You know, all those classic tropes, both cliche and otherwise, are adherent to Link, or vice versa. He's adherent to them. Ravio. Ravio? How the heck you're supposed to save his name? I don't know. Bunny guy is the exact opposite of that. He's the quintessential NPC. He's there. He's never going to give you a break. He rents you this stuff. Uh, the stuff he gives you is mandatory for the progression of the game. He talks to you about little bits of, you know, hints or, or guides or whatnot. And he basically functions fully as an NPC throughout the thing. So that's what I thought they were doing with him. It's worth noting that I could be right about that, but I shrug. The implication is much more obvious that he is actually the PC of low rule, uh, which I kind of see, which would also explain where he gets all these items from and why he breaks your pot when he moves in. I'm serious. Go, go check it. Go play the game again sometime. You have pots in your room uh, when you start the game. By the time he moves in, those pots are gone. <laughs> Anyways, uh, I, liked, I liked his character overall, though. He portrayed uh, an excellent coward who nevertheless cared, who wanted to do something. But cowardice is, is you know, we, we, all, we so often in real life, um, we look at fiction and we look at characters who are cowards. And we, we, that's such a negative trait in fiction. You know, someone who is not willing to sacrifice their life or stand up or fight against whatever is almost always universally viewed as a, almost universally viewed as a negative trait. One of the things I like is when fiction acknowledges the fact that, no, that's not negative, that's normal. The people who don't have that coward, the people who aren't fearful, the people who aren't worried about their day-to-day -day concerns, those are the heroes. Those are the big guys, the main focus characters over there, right? There's nothing wrong with being a normal person. 
in, 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 in their shadow or, or next to them or by them or supporting them or whatever. Uh, forgive me for segueing, but one of my favorite examples of this ever, I, forget, I don't remember uh, episodes, was in Deep Space Nine with Quark. Quark is a very normal person. And there are several times when he just does not want to do you know, what is required of him because he's a normal guy. He has normal concerns, just like you do, just like I do. He's worried about making bills meet. You know, he's, he's worried about making a profit. He's worried about uh, his, his status and his friendships and his family. He has everyday concerns. Picking up a gun and fighting the oppressive um, dominion or whatever is not something that equates into his mind, nor should it. I love that down-to-earth perspective, and I feel like that's where Ravio is here. Ravio? I don't know. <laughs> Purple Link. I feel like it's where Rabbit Link. There we go. Rabbit Link is at. <laughs> because, um, because again, he's, there's nothing wrong with being who he is. He's not like... Usually when we say he's a coward, we think of someone who's like, Oh, God, sniveling. No, he just doesn't have the courage to stand up and do the incredible. He's a normal guy, and I like that. I like the fact that he's just trying to make ends meet and trying to, to help out support someone that he knows can actually do what he can't. And it's probably my favorite aspect of the game as a whole from, from a story perspective. That and the culture thing with the, with the mask. I love that. Anyways, that's all I got. Sorry, guys. I wish I had more to talk about. It's a great game. I really recommend it. I'll be playing it again some point in the future, time permitting. But for now, I'm going to sign off and get immediately back to work because i got a lot of videos to record. See you around, guys. Thank you.